Uh, but let's begin. Right, like the Libyan School of Sports is an animal protection organization, and there are many, and in this country, more than in any other country, we are a country with more animal protection organizations. So we're quite old, we started many years ago, I'll show you the history a little bit, but before we enter the history, I'll show you what's the league vision and mission, which is these days any organization has to have one of these. It's basically to figure out in a couple of sentences who we are, where we're going. <coughs> and uh, the vision, you might not be able to read this, but it doesn't matter because I'll be basically saying anything that's in there. The, the, the slides are just there for reference. Uh, the vision is a society uh, where killing and harming animals for sport is in the past. So we are a specialist animal protection organization. We only deal with a type of animals, the animals that are victims of cruel sports. And of course the question is, what's a sport? What's a cruel sport? Uh, these are questions that we have to pay some time. So there are activities that people ask us, what's your opinion about this? And I have to, as a head of policy, that's part of my job, I have to consider, is this a sport that involves animals? Is there any suffering in it? Is that suffering part of the sport? Is it by accident, by design? Uh, but in generally, we cover all the sports, although we are mainly focusing in the UK, we can easily, and some of the campaigns go beyond the UK, uh, we can easily address other sports happening in other places, but we're mainly focusing in the UK. Our mission is the league protects animals against hunting, shooting, and fighting for pleasure. From all the types of sports, sports in inverted commas, where animals are used, Hunting and shooting and fighting are the ones that we've been focusing more because are the ones that have been more uh, important in the UK but also more common in the world. And, uh, and we are animal protection, so we, trend, we try to protect the animals. We not just complain about it, we just try to change the status quo and prevent them to be the victims. How? Well, uh, we have sanctuaries in the UK, land that uh, animals that they hunted can, at their own accord, move into that land and uh, people are not allowed to chase and kill them in that land so they are proper concept of sanctuary they might be running for their lives for hours and then they enter the land and the hunter shoot stop uh, and they have many and uh, there was a tactic of the league in the beginning or not the beginning in the 50s to buy land in order to give sanctuary to these animals this is something sort of quite unique very few animal protection organizations have that we investigate and expose so we go and figure out what happens with cruel sports, we get evidence, we show it to the public, and sometimes to the authorities if it's breaking any law. We improve legislation and enforcement. We are one of our peculiarities is that we do have a strong political thing. Uh, many organizations don't have that, and we do have them. That means we have the power and the ability to lobby directly to a government and to politicians to produce laws, to amend laws, to uh, increase the laws and also we have an investigator team that gather evidence for prosecutions and we can use that to persuade and forces the CPS or the police to do their job properly and we change attitudes and behavior of the general public to let people know what's going on and we change the attitude towards cruel sports trying to get more people against them over the years and we've been even quite successful. And this is just a same single sentence, it's called the boiler plate, another thing that all the reasons you have to have. That encapsulates everything I just said, so it's not quite just to read it. History. Well, we started in 1924. We are one of the oldest uh, around, uh, the RSPC is older than us. But around that time, uh, it was called differently, it was called the League for the Prohibition of Cool Sports. I think they were suffering for optimism, an attack of optimism thinking that they were going to prohibit the whole thing very quickly. Soon they realized that that was a long campaign. They changed prohibition for against cruel sports, realizing that prohibition could happen, uh, but it would take quite some time. It was founded by two people, Henry Amos and Ernest Bell. Uh, they create, this is a photo of the, what they were founded. Uh, for a few years they were together, then Bell left and created another organization in the sense of they fight anything that's inherited of the animal protection movement. They always, after a while, people see things in slightly different ways. They create their own group, groups and they split. And the league is that many times that has happened. There are many organizations that exist today that, that are splintered from the league and for one reason or another. And it's quite interesting the reason the bell left was the monarchy. So at the time, obviously the monarchy are very pro-handed, they 
used to handle war. And there was disagreement whether they should attack the monarchy or not. And the ones that they would have attacked, they would have attacked the monarchy left and left and left. Trying to just be less radical. And there was a big change at the time. Right. And through the years, through the decade, decades, we have changed a little bit what we've been doing in the sense of incorporating other uh, close ports that we didn't deal with it initially, achieving through things. For instance, in the 50s is when we bought those sanctuaries, is when we started to have this tactic of producing land, trying to remove areas from the hands. Our sanctuaries are in the middle of hunting areas, so they are sanctuaries surrounded of hunting areas, so they are very, the, the people that work there are very, uh, in a hostile conditions. Everybody comes to try to attack the sanctuaries often, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a bit more. But the whole idea is not to put it in a place where hunting doesn't happen, put it in the middle of the hunting place to give some breather to the hunting animals, specifically deer. Uh, and, and in the West Country, most of the, the sanctuaries we have are in the West Country, not all. So we, hunting also is changes from area to area in the UK, but the West Country is one of the most hunting areas of the UK, so that's why we are there. And we also there, at the 50s, we started to campaign about other close posts that are not hunting or shooting, such as the Grand National, Port Racing, which we still do. In the, the 70s is when we started to get more political, just trying just to get laws. At the beginning, it was all about exposing the cruelty and telling people how bad it was. Uh, and some things were achieved already. In the 70s, the otters, who are hunted, who were hunted before by the otter hands, otters were protected. So the population went down so fast that in 78, a law was passed to protect them. So that was the first legal uh, achievement uh, on cruel sports that they could achieve not by themselves, by or with other organizations as well. In the late, in the 80s, is when we started to go on the cover. So our way to gather evidence uh, of what's going on was a bit more sophisticated, not just watching from the outside, pretending that you hunted, go in, trying to find out what they do that nobody sees, because often these things happen in private land. And then get all this information and, and show it to the public, produce it to the public. So it was a, a shift in, in a style. And also more legal protection occurred with the badgers. The badger protection act occurred then, who had been prosecuted by badger baiting, even if it was illegal for some time already, but it happened, and it still happens today. But the Budget Protector Act uh, protected quite effectively in the sense that uh, one of the things that that act does is pre that prevents messing even with the set where the budgets leave. And hunting uh, often uses sets that block the sets of the children in it uh, as part of the hunting activity. So that had an impact already in hunting already. In 2000 is when the bigger, more known uh, bans occur because we managed to ban hunting with dogs in Scotland first in 2002, and then in, in England and Wales in 2004. That was a big deal, of course, took a long time. Essentially, it was an 80-year campaign, because that meeting that photo showed you yesterday, uh, before, that was when they said, we want to ban these, remember, they were called the prohibition. And they did it 80 years later, so it takes about 80 years to get this. We also created something that's called the Animal Crime Watch, which still happens today. So it's a, it's a hotline and, and a website mm -hmm. where people that saw things about hunting, uh, they could call, they give information. It's an intellig intelligence gathering system uh, where now we have uh, dedicated people that just collect the calls or the emails and that might be given to the police or others. That was something that we have now we created in the 80s. And we campaigned on other subjects. Shooting, snaring as part of shooting, greyhounds racing, horse racing, bullfighting. This is the time I was at the league 10 years ago, and I started the bullfighting campaign uh, when I was there, and it still is going on now. And in the 2010s, we have increased our investigations team in terms of yeah, becoming more professional than they used to be. Many are ex-police officers, ex-surveillance officers. The people in High Crime Watch are ex-surveillance officers as well, so we become more professional in that regard. And we, not that long ago, we started to campaign against dog fighting, which is illegal, it has been for many years, but it still occurs. And so we extended our work towards that. So this is the history. Tell me a bit more about a couple of the things I mentioned before. The sanctuaries, as I said before, this is a map. And all these dogs you see there are what some of our sanctuaries. Uh, sometimes it's altogether about 3,000 acres of land that we have that are protected for the animals. Some of them, we own it. So we, if somebody trespasses, like a hunter, we can sue them. Others, we don't own the land, but we own the sporting rights. 
what we bought is the sporting rights. You can buy the rights separate to the land. That means the land belongs to somebody else, but nobody can hunt, nobody can shoot because we own the sporting rights. So it is another tactic, is buy the rights, not just the land. And, and different colors means some of them, <coughs> they are only the, la the rights, others the rights and the land. And uh, you see this sign over there, which is a sign in our property, you see these holes, these are bullet holes. So as I said before, we are surrounded to hunters, so we are in a hostile environment. And often we have dead animals thrown away just to provoke us, guns being shot against our sound. So it's kind of uh, has been for, for many years quite difficult to do to maintain them. I and mean, we don't have people in each country, most of the land is just land. And it's not even fenced, obviously, because if it was fenced, the animals could not go in to protect themselves. But we have one in Barons Down, Barons Down is here. There. And uh, Barons Down, 550 acres. This is the place we have, and we do have a house there, and we have a conservation center. We try, and we also, the airline also helps to preserve local flora and fauna. And we're getting more into that conservation side of it and education side of it. And mostly in the West Country, we do have some in Shropshire, some in, uh, in Derbyshire, not just there, but mostly in the West, in the West Country. And the animal hand crime, which I've mentioned before, which is quite unique as well, is this uh, number. <coughs> that you can call and leave anonymous information on an email. If you ever see anything about hunting, there are some cards that are left in the table there and over here where you can pick up and you have this information there. And that's uh, that where uh, that might lead to prosecution or not. We have investigators, uh, we're trying to investigate in a, a covert uh, way. That means we're not like the hands ups. The hands ups interfere with the hand, they are very present there. Sometimes they present is already the terror and the, the hand will go away. Um, hand monitors, which is what we have, we don't, we don't, we're not saboteurs, we are monitors, we always been, uh, means we observe but we don't interfere. And of course we, if we gather evidence for uh, prosecutions, if they see us they might change the behavior and that evidence might be impossible to gather. So one of the techniques we use is observe and not be seen. So often we are camouflaged from a long distance, two or three miles away, with big lens, and that's how we got that. So we are not that in the middle of it, but we are around and, and finding out what's going on. So when there is TPLOS that arrives to us through Animal Crime Watch, we can then deploy if we have enough uh, investigators. 99% we don't have them, so 99% we can't do anything because that kind of thing happened for all the UK, we don't have a big team. But if we're lucky, we happen to be close to where we are, we can do that. Or sometimes we just gather this information and reports are produced. This is an example of a report I wrote and we published a few uh, a couple of months ago about stack hunting with a lot of information. This comes from investigations we produce plus uh, general public intelligence that and then we accumulate all these, we do a statistics, so all the information might be used in one way or another. So it's never wasted. Right. So which are the campaigns we do? I already mentioned it, but I'll go through quickly. There are three main campaigns that we are prioritizing now. If you ask me in a year, they might be different. In two years, they might be different. We always see what's necessary to do, and then our resources are then channeled towards it. At the moment, hunting is still the main campaign. That's why we're telling you from now on. Uh, it always been, it still is, because hunting, although it's been banned, still carries on, and we still have to address that. Shooting, shooting is all a campaign that we also do, and shooting means shooting birds, uh, pheasants, rep, partridge, uh, ducks, uh, grouse, and we do have a specific campaign for these particular animals, and in different areas, grouse shooting is more of a Scottish thing, and we have people in Scotland, we have representatives in each of the devolved countries, Northern Ireland, Scotland, uh, England, and Wales, and uh, Wales and England. And Dog fighting, which we started recently and is becoming a priority now because we started we need to get it out there. So it's one of the, our three major subjects, but we still don't know that much about it. It's a very difficult subject, so we're still learning a lot about this. And we, it, it, we see what it can do with this. And then we have this other second level of campaign. So we do less about them, but we still do something. And we have done more in the past in some of them. We might be more, do more in the future in some of them, but at the moment, they're taking a second side, which is trophy hunting. That means that's beyond the UK, because there's very little trophy hunting in the UK. There's a little bit. Stack hunting is part of trophy hunting, but mostly it's overseas. 
and the UK is not the top uh, trophy hunting country anyway. The United States is 91% of the trophies that are produced in trophy hunting are going to North America, the United States, so it's mainly an American thing. Uh, but we kind of invented it within, with, with the colonies, so therefore we should participate in all the campaigns to stop it. The budget call, which is something that many animal protection organizations in the UK are involved, we are in this team budget that is a coalition of more than 30 organizations, we're part of it. Still happened, starting in 2012, 12, and it still is going on. Bull fighting, uh, which is again, it doesn't happen here, but it happens in many of the places that British people go on holiday, Spain, Portugal, and France, in Europe, and, and other countries in Latin America. Greyhound racing, uh, which we started quite some time ago, and we're still on it. We recently changed our approach on it. We used to be reformist, we used to try to improve the lives of the hounds. Uh, greyhounds and let us know why. So now we are abolitionists. So we are aiming for the abolition of the whole thing. And horse racing, that we mainly have concentrated our efforts on the uh, national since the beginning, and we still are. Uh, and perhaps we're going to extend it further in the future. In the moment, we're focusing on that. As I said before, if you're more interested in any of these subjects, there is information on this on the table. But now I'm going to talk to you mostly about hunting. <coughs> hunting is banned in Scotland. Uh, 2002 and England and Wales in 2004 is not banned in Northern Ireland. This is one of the areas that is still there is no ban. And in the areas where there's, ban, there's a ban, it's not properly implemented. So hunting continues and uh, therefore having that law is not enough. We want to strengthen it, we want to improve it and it needs to be properly enforced and that, more, that means you need to, you need to address the police and the CPS and the courts and that's part of the work we do. Traditionally, in the UK, hunting, which, by the way, as you already know, hunting, if I say just hunting, means hunting with dogs. If I was giving this talk in America, I would have to specify that, because in America, hunting means anything with a gun. Uh, or many other countries in Europe will be shooting, stalking, that all will be called hunting. So for them to know the difference, I would have to specify hunting with dogs. But in the UK, <coughs> hunting with dogs is hunting. If you use birds, you use the term shooting, if you use uh, camouflage to approach deer, you use the word stalking, there are different terms for different concepts. Uh, the hunting with dogs, organized hunting, that means people with the function to get to kill a particular animal and rules and, and a club. So four victims we have in this country, which is the mink, the fox, the deer and the hare. And the mink recently used to be the otter, but since the otter uh, was protected, the ones that were hunting otters moved to a mink. So there are four organized hunts, the mink hunts, the fox hunts, the stag hunts, and the hare hunts, uh, which they still operational today, and they still kill animals, and they still need to dress this. So that, uh, fox hunting is the most common of all. It's about 300 hunts, meaning groups of people that do this all over the UK. Uh, including in Scotland. Not that many in Scotland. Scotland has fewer than any of the other regions, mostly in England. It was quite a few. Uh, then start hunting. They used to be quite common and widespread, and only three hands left. So a big jump from 300 in the first country to, to start hunting, only three. All in the West Country, all close to our country. So that's why we are there. Then there's also hair coursing that was also a sport, and it's not hunting itself, because it's not about killing the animals, it's about a competition between two dogs to see which one catches the hair first. And that used to be quite popular as well, and it also was banned with the Hunting Act in 2004, and it still does happen occasionally, but the, the Hunting Act is stronger on hair coursing than hunting, so it's been more difficult for illegal hair coursers to carry on doing this than for hunters. Uh, hares could also be killed by a pack of hounds, uh, and that's not called hare coursing, it's called hare hunting. And depending on the type of hounds, it's called sometimes differently. They could be harriers, that are smaller breeds than fox hounds, or even smaller than that, like these ones, that are beagles. And when they are beagles, the whole thing is called beagling. So beagling means hunting with a pack of beagles' hares. Could be even bassets, even smaller than that. So, but the hares been the big things. Like quite a few, about, about a third of the hunts in general are hare hunts. <coughs> and mink hunts, there are not that many, perhaps 21 at the moment. Uh, and they used to be the other hunts, but they, since 1978, moved to mink hunts. And they use different breeds of, of hounds. They use otter hounds, you'll see them later in the picture. 
Uh, a bit of a history of the anti-movement anti achievements, because legally we have achieved quite a lot. The first big achievement happened in 1835, because uh, there were many other cruise ports than these ones. They used to be bear baiting here, bull baiting, bull fighting, they actually started here before they Spain, and, and, and cock fighting, the dog fighting. And in 1835, <coughs> bear baiting, bull baiting, and dog fighting was banned in a single law. So a long time ago, we were pioneers in laws that ban cruel sports. And uh, the idea was, well, let's ban them all now. It took quite a long time to ban the other ones. Cockfighting was in 1849, but then all the other hunting, that is what it took a really long time. Uh, the organized campaign against, uh, against uh, cruel sports happened around 1923, 24. The ban of other hunting happened in 78, as I mentioned before. The Scottish ban of hunting in 22, and in 2004, in Wales. Mm -hmm. So we've been banning cruel sports and with less or more success. So that's a visit tradition in this country to stop the cruelty to animals. Yeah, just on, on that note, I was just wondering, <coughs> in those days, in, in the 1800s, did you have more information about how that all came about? Did they, did they have another? Yes. Idea? Well, it, there's a word that explains it. It's called the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is this movement, social political movement, philosophical really, that, that moved through the whole Europe, in which there was a stop, look at what we're doing, that's a paraphrasing, but the stop, look at what we're doing, forget whether something is traditional or not, and use common sense. So you end up being more rational about reality. This is what the Enlightenment is it's all about. It worked differently in different countries, and the UK worked very well. So there was a lot of philosophy that started saying, it doesn't matter about tradition, let's look forward, let's look at evidence. And that generated the anti-slavery movement, the anti-slavery movement generated the animal protection movement, the animal protection movement generated the anti movement. Mm -hmm. So it's all linked to that concept. The Will, William Wilderforce created, was an anti-slavery person, created the RSPCA, <coughs> and so it's often linked at that time all these subjects. So there's a period where people start questioning everything. Right. People start questioning. And the most important thing, I think, is tradition had not the same value that it had before. People just said, well, so what is traditional? That never had happened before. In other countries, it didn't work that well. So it, it can, I, I still think we are in the, that enlightenment process. Until we ban all these things, we haven't finished enlightenment. We started then, we haven't finished it. And what happens uh, through all this history of the league? Well, most of the stuff was about counting the public. There was a lot of printed material. Now we have internet and all these sort of things. In the early days, we only had posters. We used to, some, some of them just by ourselves, that was our logo, own logo, or by other people. We started to get together with other groups, coalitions. In fact, the hunting net was banned because three big groups got together and pushed it together. The League Against Post, Post I4, which I used to work with myself as well a few years ago, and, and um, the RSPCA. When these three groups got together, the whole thing uh, acquired a huge momentum. But from the very beginning, this is one of the early posters from 1923 <coughs> of the League. You can see that the, the founders of the League names are over there. Already, not, not picture, just a drawing, already showing the cruelty of Stadler. Uh, but as I said before, a group of three organizations got together in a few years. And of course, the Hans Subtrace Association had existed for quite some time as well. And they were doing a very strong and direct uh, job in trying to prevent individual animals to be caught, interfering with the hand, preventing the hand, catching the animals. But they were not listened by the politicians. And it, in a way, the movement kind of got split into the people doing direct action on the ground and those that were lobbying to the politicians. And the RSPCA, the League, and, and I thought we were the lobbyists. And we started to push that lobby component and and using our resources and money just to get publicity. That's the year around the year where the ban happened in 2004, where we already achieved 73% of the population with us. We kept doing polls, and now it's even more. So at the time, banning went with fewer of the population against hunting that is now. And we had all sorts of, of buses. You see the three logos down the left. All sorts of activity just to get the momentum going, the balloons, etc. But the other side also get organized. And they are mainly organized through the Countryside Alliance that changed their name to kind of get more, uh, get, uh, go beyond hunting and cross policy into all that other rural issues. But they managed to gather a lot of support against the ban, and they had big demonstrations like this one, this one with a very powerful 
uh, that was coming there, obviously, at that time. Uh, <coughs> to out with me, which is a huge amount of people. We managed to galvanize a lot of people. Some of them quite violent in many respects. That was in Brighton. They would put dead animals and say, if you ban hunting, they all would end up like this. And they said the same thing with the hounds. Obviously, it didn't happen. And they really got violent in, in, in the parliament, just really close to the vote with the demonstration they were doing outside, when they eventually they, they got really violent, and that really obviously didn't help their cause, and perhaps it did help for the MPs to vote in our side. So eventually, after a very long parliamentary process, we, in going back and forth from the Lords to the Commons, and, and using the Parliamentary Act to force the will of the Commons, because the Lords were uh, always blocking it, Hunting Act was passed in 2004, and that was a big deal. But that didn't stop hunting as we all hoped, hunting continued for several reasons. First, the whole hunting fraternity decided that they would defy this law. They would not obey it. They would find ways around it, ways to circumvent it. They didn't convert. They could have converted to drug hunting. I'll tell you later what that is, which is a sport that existed before. None of them did. In fact, the year before the ban was passed, they all signed what is called the hunting declaration, which is a signature that says, if this law is passed, I'll commit myself to break the law. 50,000 people signed. Of course, the, it was passed. Then prosecutions could have been yeah. far easier with that piece of document. But it's all the conspiracy, signatures disappeared. Conspiracy, isn't it? Yeah. The, all the signatures disappeared. All the websites talking about them disappeared. <laughs> all the evidence that that happened disappeared. Until I kind of uncovered it again a few years back. And there's still things in the internet. And now it's back. And actually, I found one copy of the declaration. Yeah. And I spread it around the world. And everyone knows it's there. And the signatures, no, we don't know what happened. Perhaps they're in the countryside alliance basement, or they've been burned. We don't know. But the point is, from the beginning, they were defiant. And that's already a problem. So they developed alibis. They started to exploit some of the exemptions of the hunting act. They were meant for somebody else and not to use them instead. And developed trail hunting, I'll tell you in a minute, which is essentially a false alibi that explains why there are so few prosecutions, because they managed to find ways around them. Uh, they also have hired, they basically could hunt in private land and have no access to anyone. They prevent people to watch. So before they were quite happy with all Lucas, now they block the roads, they intimidate any witnesses, and they keep doing these things without witnesses. Uh, they rely on the non enforcement of the enforcement authorities, the police and the CPS, which they always said hunting is not a priority, animals they are not that important for them, they are for us. Therefore, they don't use many resources, and they rely on that. So, and it's true that if you go from one police force to another, the, the level of enforcement of the country is very bad in some, mediocre in others, okay. In, in others, I've never seen a force that does it properly, though. So there's always less than we think we should, we should do. And this not, the law doesn't even have custodial sentences. If you break the law, it's only a fine, up to 5,000 pounds. And normally, the average is 500, so they never reach 5,000. So they just pay, pay, pay the penalty and carry on doing it. So there's no matter the terror in this regard, if you saw the term. And they were always hoping that the law would be repealed. From the very beginning, the conservatives, they said that if we were in power, we will repeal this ban. They never accepted it either. And so the hunters were hoping that that will happen next year. So they will never change the infrastructure or convert to anything else, hoping that next year they will be back in business. In fact, neither didn't have the police either or the CPS that they were thinking in the same way. Why should we just invest money and in time in enforcing this if next year it's not going to be there anymore? But it's still there. So it's been 12 years already. It's still there. Well, let me tell you a bit about what's hunting in case you don't know much about it. Most people heard about it, but they don't quite know what it's about. So I'll tell you a little bit more. And also what's happening today. And, and then you, the reason I explained what's happening before and, now, and today is for you to realize how very little has changed. Right, hunting is a seasonal thing. Don't bother in reading the text. A lot of text is just for me, in case I get lost. Right. But, but uh, just look at pictures. Uh, the, it's a seasonal activity. It's a winter thing. It doesn't happen really, except otter hunt and uh, mink hunt. The others are all winter activity. It normally begins the proper season in November, or for the last week of October. They do something before it's called cat hunting, which is to train the hounds to chase foxes. But the proper season begins in November and ends around March or early April. Uh, anybody knows why it's a winter activity rather than a summer activity? The crops. The crops. Part of it, but it's not the main reason. 
because there's less leaves on the trees and you can see through the vegetation. Completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> because, and that's the important thing about knowing about hunting, hunting uses hounds, hounds hunt by scent, not by sight. Greyhounds hunt by sight, so hair coursing is by sight. Hunting is by scent. So it's a scent related thing. The scent, so the, all the animals they hunt, the foxes mainly, they are nocturnal, they only move at night. And uh, during the day, they are in the dens. They, but they have a scent they left during the night. If it's hot, the scent evaporates in the morning, and by the time the hands are there, there's nothing left. It's the temperature. The temperature has to be low, so to maintain the scent in the ground, because the animal had was active when it was not dark. And that's why it's in winter. And so it's basically, when it gets hotter, it's, it's a waste of time trying to hunt. <coughs> that's the main reason. Because they're scent animals. Right. One, they go and decide today they're going to be hunting, but the day before they go hunting, something already happened in that area. Terrier men, which are contractors that use terriers in going quote bites, they go around trying to find holes and badger sets in the area where they're planning to hunt to block them. In the, in the jargon of hunting, that's called stopping the, the hole. The idea is they don't want the animal to hide because the whole thing about hunting is not about killing the animal. Is about chasing the animal. It's the most important thing to understand. Is the, whether they kill it or not is quite irrelevant. The reason they're doing it with a horse is because that's the whole thing, chasing an animal for a long time on a horse. Some of them doing on foot in, in areas where the horses are not, uh, would not be good enough, like uh, Lake District or Wales, high, high mountains. These are the called fell parks or, or gun parks that go on foot. Most of the rest of the country are on horse because the whole thing is about chasing. The stack hunting, the chase is about four hours, could be about four hours chasing the same animal. In, in, in fox hunting, it could be an hour, could be 20 minutes, depending on the fox and where it goes. Uh, so they don't want the fox to hide. So they, they block all the holes so that the fox always has to run. Of course, if they block a budget set, they're breaking the law already because the budget sets are protected by the budget protection act that I mentioned before. So, but they do it anyway because they don't want it to hide. What happens is there is one they didn't leave, they didn't block, and immediately the animal hides. The man is called to bone the fox, not to kill it, so the whole thing continues. So they are, the objective is to run and chase it. If they could kill it straight away, they would not do it. They would chase it for longer, which means all this is a stress for the animal. It's a suffering of hunting. It's not just the way it dies. It's the way that leads to the death, that is constant being chased by an animal. Uh, the, they, then they do meet particular days a week. They are different hands. They're territorial. This is there's a hunting area. That's the only area they operate. Another area that's the only area they operate. They have then a schedule every year, uh, which is called meat card, with the days they're going to go out. Normally Saturday, and then another day of the week. Sometimes twice a week. Sometimes three times a week. Depends how big the hunt is. And that second day could be Monday, could be Tuesday, and depends if the hunt will be one or the other. And the meeting is called the meet. And the meat card is the, the, the schedule, the calendar where all the meats will be. And they will meet in a meeting point, normally at 1045, and then that's when the whole thing begins. And then this group of people in charge of this, and other people watching. The people watching on their own horses, they are called the field, as a collective noun. The field is everybody on a horse that is just watching and chasing and everything, but doing nothing. And then we have the hand supporters, the people walking on vehicles, looking from a distance, sometimes going ahead with binoculars. It's like the closest thing that I can, I can uh, use to describe it is like training spotting. It's like this sort of activity of very passive, very kind of uh, obsessed people, that do, but they're not part of it, they're not part of the club, they're just in the, in the upskirts of it, but they help in, in some ways. Uh, and they don't pay for it, while the field do pay, uh, what is called a cap, they, for every time they go out, they pay uh, like a ticket to, to participate. But the people running the show are the whole, what they call hunt stuff. And there are three types, and the huntsman is the most important one, which is the one in control of the hounds. He's the one that directs the hound from one place to another, and he uses the horn to do that, the sound of the horn. So that if you see somebody with the horn, that is the huntsman. He's the only one that has it. He has an assistant, it's called the whippering, and the whippering is called the whippering because it has a whip. So if he has a whip, that's a whippering, he has a horn, has the huntsman. And the whippering helps the huntsman normally is behind collecting the hounds that left the park or got lost or, is, or, or, or sometimes it's called on point, just looking, waiting for something to happen. Then we have the master. The master is the boss. 
is the person in charge. A uh, hand uh, as a group has either one master or two or three. If there are more than one, they call joint masters. If there's only one, is the master. Normally, it's somebody of a class of higher class than the rest, but not necessarily. Uh, and that master is the boss of the huntsman and the whipper, the employer of the huntsman and the whipper. And uh, he's the one that will talk to the landowner, solve any problems, and decide where to go on the day. But uh, what, so as a meet, where they're going to meet, but from that moment that the hounds are free, the huntsman is in charge to which direction uh, the, the hound will go. Sometimes there's more than one master in the hunt. If they have a field that is very big with a lot of riders, sometimes they get in the way of the hounds. And they have one master, it's called the field master, that is there to control the field. So it's a proper master in charge of everything, and a field master just to control the paying field, to keep them always behind everybody else. And the way for any onlooker and any member of the field to know who is who, because if you just join the hand, you need to know who, who are the handsmen, because you can't be on their way, you can't go further than them. So they have to be something to tell them apart. So they dress differently. These red color things that you often see are associated to hunting, this is only for the hunt stuff, for the master, the, the whippering, or, or the huntsman. Not necessarily always red. They don't call it red, by the way. They call it pink. This, the, 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 the jargon of hunting is very <coughs> special. I think that we use in a particular term, we will use another word. Pink, for that is pink. But in this case, you see it's blue. Doesn't matter what it is, but it has to be different than anybody else. And each hand will have their own uniform colors. Most of them will be pink, some of them will be blue. But if you just look at these three, you, can't, you don't know whether they are the huntsman or the whippering. But if you look at the three, one has the horn, OK, that's the huntsman. The other has a whip, that's the whippering. If you are closer, you can also tell them apart like the buttons. They have like insignias that are different, and you can tell them apart. And the terriermen, which are contractors, are always around. They, they go in quad bikes with big boxes and they have the terrier in the box. Because what happens, as I said before, if very soon the fox hides in a hole that they didn't block the day before, the terrierman is called. He blocks all, uh, all the entrances, leaves two open, gets a terrier in one, and forces the fox to leave in the other. And that's called bolting the fox. So the chase continues. If it, that doesn't happen, because the fox already recognized that that's going to happen, and it stays there, he might dig it out. And, and they might just throw it, and if it doesn't run, it might shoot it straight away. But that they don't want that. They, they want it to run. And the first thing they do is called drawing. Is when they have this meeting point, they go to a copse, an area uh, they call covered. Covered means an area where it might be a fox in, uh, or hair. And, and they would wait around and send the house to see whether they can find the scent of the fox that left the night before. That's called drawing. Drawing is looking for a scent. If they find it, what happens is the hounds make a noise <coughs> and they put themselves in a line. You might be able to see here, it's very far away, but I'm talking. These are different hounds, one here, one there, here, in a line. And I can show you this. You can hear the hound the sound. They, what they do is speak. Hounds don't bark, they speak. You'll hear it now. This is a person, this is not a hound. This is a fell pack. In a fell pack, they lose these codes rather than having a hole. This, they say either they cry or they speak. That's the language they use. And that communicates to the other hand of the pack that they found a set. So essentially, for an onlooker, he, you always know that they found something because you can hear it, even if you don't see the pack. And if you see them in a line, that means it's a very strong ascent. In a line means the hounds already figure out which direction the sand goes. If they find the sand, the animal has gone that way or this way. But they can tell because that part is a bit stronger than that part. If they can tell, they get into the line. That means they already chase it. The fox also knows this. So the fox hears this, they know blind me. They are after me. So from that point, he knows he's being hunted. And the, the stress begins at that point. Gonna pass this one. And what happens eventually, it's gonna be caught by the hounds, either because it goes to ground and the terrorman digs them out and gives them to hounds, or they cut them and they bring it to pieces. And these of you here are not gonna show you what it happens, so just not to ruin your evening. But basically they repeat into pieces. And there is a horn call that happens when that instant occurs to let everybody know they've caught it. And in a normal hand they might chase three or four foxes, they might 
catch four, three or four. If, if it's a lucky for us, it's a blank day, that means they all escape. And if there are hand saboteurs in the middle, they often manage to interfere and stop the hands. Uh, Kevin, the, the, the I'm just going to pass that one. And that's the terrier man doing the hole if the fox didn't go out. And they use this terrier with an electronic locator when the terrier goes in. They send a signal so they can identify from the outside where the terrier is and dig. Because the terrier will stop when they see the fox and then dig there. Which is legal, by the way. The Hunting Act didn't ban this. Regulated, created some conditions in which you, can, you have to do it, but didn't ban it. Right, I'm just going to show you the, the different type of dogs that they use for different types of hands. Before the ban, that's what happens. There were hair causing that occurred, it was legal, and that was using grey hounds uh, or lurchers, one or the other. It's still legal in Ireland, both Northern Ireland, very popular in the Republic of Ireland. When you see a picture of two grey hounds chasing a hare with muscles, that is Ireland. The, the law in Ireland, it's the Republic of Ireland, for, for them to do that. Doesn't mean that it's safe. They still kill it. The impact that, uh, of the hound is enough to sometimes kill, it, kill the, the hare. Uh, this is caution, look hunting, but then hunting quarry. We have fox hounds uh, uh, that are used for fox hunts. Particular breed is the English fox hunt in America, they have another breed. They also have fox hunting of harriers, a smaller breed uh, than a fox hunt, but they also go for foxes. This is the difference. This is the American fox hunt, this is the English fox hunt, this is the harriers. Shorter legs. Similar shape, very difficult to have apart from a distance, but it's a little bit shorter. And the hand that is hard, that has harriers is called a harrier pact. So if you hear the word harrier, it means it has harriers. But the harriers, the harrier packs, can either go for foxes or they can go for hares. The harrier pack can either go for one or the other or both. And then we have hare hunting that happens with beagles, as I mentioned before, and also with bassets. And I will only go for hares. And stack hounds use stack hounds, which are even taller than fox hounds, but they're all very similar breed. The mink hounds are the ones that are completely different. You see a very hairy, hairy type of dog. The otter hound is the breed, uh, because it's all happening in water. Minks and otters are in water, so they were swimming, chasing the otter or chasing the mink. And this pair helps them to swim and to float around. These days they, they use a mix of, the, of both fox hands and otter hands because there are very few otter hands left. And then before the ban, already existed a hunting without chasing any animal. That already existed in two forms. Something is called drag hunting. They use fox hounds, the sensual hounds, but they follow an artificial scent uh, and not an animal. And clean wood hunting, that uh, they use another type of hound, the black hound. So the black hound that is also so that which is the one. Also using hunting, but the bloodhounds they never were intended to hunt animals. They were developed to chase people that escape from prisons. It's the typical animal that one is a prisoner escaping, you just hear those noises, that's bloodhound. Because they have a stronger sense of smell than the others, apparently. So so the bloodhound, the clean boot, it's called the clean boot, but they don't chase anybody who's following a trail, they chase a person right. This this existed before. So we hoped that when the hunting animals starts, they would convert to this. And they didn't. They created something different called trail hunting. And everybody is confused about these things because people use the term trail hunting and drag hunting as is the same thing and it's not the same thing. And that's how they get away with it. They created something which is basically an alibi of illegal hunting, but they make it sure that people get confused with something that was legal before, mm. so then the authorities and everybody else thinks it's fine because that existed before, but it's not. And not only now, starts, people start to see the difference because we, the League and others, and I in particular I created a, a report when I was at Eiffel called Trail of Lies, which is the expose of the live trail hunting. Since then, people start to see the difference. I'm going to show you now the difference. So, important thing, trail hunting is not drag hunting, uh, black hound hunting is not trail hunting either, and, and black hound hunting is not drag hunting. There are three different things. So I'm going to tell you the three of them. So drag hunting, essentially, is like that. It's somebody uh, with a string and a piece of cloth with a liquid which is normally aniseed or a non-animal based scent. 
that the hound's been trained to follow. He runs around, then they, they have been trained to follow, and their horses just go beyond. They know exactly where to go because the huntsman knows where the trail is going to land. They choose areas that they're not going to have foxes or hares. Specifically, they, they, they have things to jump. It's all very controlled. And when the hounds found the piece of cloth, they, they won. And that's the end of it. This is basically called drug hunting because there's somebody dragging this piece of cloth with an animal scent. And, but they use fox hunts, the same hounds, the same breed that the normal hounds use. The clean bird hunting is very similar, but that's the difference. There's nobody dragging anything. They just follow the natural scent of people running. Well, people that they, from the beginning, said, you have to follow that guy. They go running, sometimes one, sometimes three, like here. The hounds follow the scent, and the people follow them and horses behind. And when they arrive, they just got a cattle of, 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 of praise. So it's the, the more humane of all, because it doesn't involve anything else. And these black hounds, they never were trained to follow anything else other than humans. So this not track hunting, because nobody dragging anything, it's just a person right? Often people get and it's black hound there. But trail hunting, trail hunting was invented after the hunting that was passed. It didn't exist before. It was invented in 2004 as a way to circumvent the, the ban. The countryside alliance defined it as a, a way to simulate trail, traditional hunting. It was all about trying to make it as look as similar to what was hunted before in all respects of, of in shapes. They also said that it's a temporary activity, that is also always a, a simulation. So if you see illegal hunting and you, you denounce it to the police, they say, no, no, it's not illegal hunting. It looks like illegal hunting because we make it look like illegal hunting, but it's not because we try to imitate what we used to do before. So it's all done on purpose. But I'll show you the differences now. There are many, but I'm just going to go quickly. Drug hunting existed in the 18th century. So I'm going to just compare drug hunting and trade hunting because they use the same sort of dog, so it's easy to get confused. While well, trail hunting in 2004, the objective of trail hunting is just have an activity where there is no animals involved, while the objective of trail hunting is to replicate something that was already happening before, replicate quarry hunting. Uh, drug hunting is a long-lasting sport, while trail hunting is considered a temporary activity while the ban is still in place. There are rules in drug hunting, there are no rules in trail hunting, everybody can do whatever they want. In drug hunting, they don't use any animal basis scent. It's an seed and other things, so to prevent the, the hounds be confused uh, by real things. In, drug, in trail hunting, they use an animal basis scent to be sure they get confused. If they used to be fox hunts, they use fox urine. If they used to be hare hunts, they use hare urine to be sure that they are going to get confused. The opposite that should happen. Uh, so hounds are trained in drug hunting not to follow animals, while in trail hunting, they follow to follow animals, which that's why eventually they will follow an animal. And I'm going to look quick here, but I'm going to highlight the three more important ones in red here. The animals that I just mentioned, the, most, the second more important one, trail hands always put the trail in areas likely to have a fox or likely to have a hare, while in drag hands they do the opposite, unlikely to be a fox or likely to have a hare. And the third and most important, in drag hands, they always know, the handsman always knows where the trail is. So if you see the pack going elsewhere, he will know that's not my trail. He will stop them, put them back. In trail hunting, they don't tell the huntsman where the trail is, so he can claim ignorance. So if the hounds own cry, remember own cry to find the scent, that might be a real fox, that might be the trail, but he doesn't know, so he doesn't mm -hmm. stop them. And, and how likely is that they're going to find a fox if they follow, they've been trained to follow the same scent? and they put it in an area where it's likely to find fox, very likely. And then, if somebody's filming and says, look, they kill a fox, say, I didn't know. So it's a perfect alibi. It's a cobra designed to get away with it. They could have done this, none converted, there's 300 hands, none converted to this, they all done that. So, how do we know it's a cobra? Well, because if you look at the prosecutions, if I it's true. These are the number of prosecutions that somebody was found guilty. And which are the defenses, the excuses they put. This is trail hunting. So the majority of the people in the prosecutions that are involved in legal hunting, they said they were doing trail hunting, and the judge said, no, you know, you were doing something else. And this is the number of defendants, people, these are the prosecutions, dead people. 
62% of the people found guilty of illegal hunting, they said they were doing threat hunting. So threat hunting is false or above. And that's the most interesting thing of all. We've been monitoring hunts since the hunting act was enacted for 10 years. And we've never seen threat hunting, really. We only seen people saying they do it, people explaining they do it, but actually very few times we've seen something that resembles it. In, when I was at IFO, I produced this trail of light report I mentioned before, and I did some statistics from the investigations uh, that IFO had. And, and this is a chart that says the number of times that our investigators saw somebody laying a trail. You would expect if you do trail hunting, you always, every day, you should see somebody laying it. And only in 1% of the times the investigation went out, so during 10 years, somebody laying a This is covering. Uh, 478 reports for 10 years. I left IFO and joined the league, and I kept doing this, getting the new investigation results, contacting other groups. So last year, I collected more than 4,000 reports from monitors, covering the majority of the hands, and I recalculated the number, and the number is now down to 0.04%. So only 0.04% investigation being seen in Fox Hunt, they saw somebody later, and that trail might not be real, they might still be fake, might not have any scent. And that means 99% of the time, they don't even bother to wear it. They just say they do it, mm -hmm. but they don't even bother. They try the first two years, police believe them, CPS believe them, they stop doing it, go out hunting as it is before. If they stop them, they say they do it, but they have Because we are there watching, and we haven't seen it. There's four ways to do this. The four models of operand is to break the law through threat hunting. Models one is laying no train, which I just said. 99% of them, they do nothing, they don't lay any train, they just say they do. Some, they use MO2, creating a false evidence. Some, what they do is one day, they lay a train, they film it, they keep it, and then if they're uh, accused another day, they will use that footage saying, oh, that's what we done today. Another, they use what we call the faking version. Faking it is basically every day, do have somebody in the morning laying a trail that has no scent, film it, just in case that day they're going to be caught hunting illegally, they can't produce the footage, but there's nothing. How we know? Because we can see them doing it, and we can see a fox coming, a uh, hound uh, cutting the bite, and not reacting to them. Obviously, there's no scent there. This is a, uh, an image of this. This is somebody, that person, with a sock here, there's nothing, walking through here. This is the pack coming, and they just deviate a few seconds later, as if there was nothing. So we have evidence. So that we do lay it, see it, lay it, <coughs> and we know that it's not real. And the last time is the one that do put a scent, but is a urine scent. They do put it in a place where animals are likely to occur. So basically, this is provoking an accident. They put it in such a way that they can prove that there was a scent, they can prove that they formed it, but the accident is almost inevitable. That's why accidents are very common in hunting, almost hardly ever seen in drug hunting. So it's definitely designed for that to happen. <coughs> And if you're accused, then the police say, well, we can't pursue accused because they didn't know, they claim they didn't know, is an accident, and they tend to believe. Sometimes the evidence is so strong that you can prove they are lying, so there have been successful prosecutions of threat hunting, and I ran many of my, uh, I was writing <coughs> prosecutions as well, at the league, and I thought, and, I thought, and I, some of the successful prosecutions are mine, and I found ways to prove it, but were so difficult to do, that must go away, but some don't. Can I just ask a clarification? Sure. I, I, I'm not quite sure what the accident is. Accident means uh, a member of the public seen a pack of hounds killing a fox. <coughs> and they call police. This is illegal. And they, and they take photos and they go to the press. And the, the police knocks the door of the huntsman and says, <coughs> You're supposed to be doing hunting. They kill a fox. And they say, Oh, it was an accident. Right. I didn't know. I could not stop it. It was too late. That's so it's what a fake it accident. It's, it's a design accident, it's a fake accident. But the problem is, if you, if you, were, you were a good police officer who said, I don't believe you. I'm going to investigate this. The problem is, they say, oh, fine, an accident, they move away. So there is not a chasing up, trying to prove it, trying to find out whether it's real or not. It's just believing that when they say an accident, it's going to be an accident. Why? Because it's low priority in the police. Uh, kind of so, uh, what we, I'm quite close to finish, what we, uh, Trying to achieve. What are the current objectives we have at the moment? It might change tomorrow, might change next year. But at the moment in this campaign, these are the objectives we have. We want to secure and strengthen and strengthen the law in Scotland. Let's call it the protection of wild mammals, Scotland, because it's not working at all. We have some prosecutions in England and Wales, 
Nani is called an now. It was even worse. It was the first law. It was even worse than the anti -nav. For 12 years, we nothing. Uh, so we want to strengthen it and secure it in the sense that we don't want anybody to repeat it. And that's where it vans already. So it, we are in the process that the Scottish government is already believing us, is already realizing this law doesn't work, and is quite the, the kind of keen to change it. There was a consultation, there was a lord, a lord Bonamy, uh, that looked into it, and he concluded, yes, it's not working. So that's likely to happen soon, in a year or two. We also wanted to secure, secure and strengthen the Hunting Act, you know, just the Scottish one, the English and Wales one, because it's not working. It, we want to strengthen it in the sense to make it easier to enforce, uh, but also secure it because there have been many attempts to ban it, sorry, to repeal it or to weaken it. Mm -hmm. So we need to preserve that first, keep it, and improve it. Because if we, they remove it all together, we can improve it. We also want to persuade major landowners to ban trail hunting. So major landowners like the National Trust could say, no, no, we're not going to allow trail hunting because <coughs> we don't trust you. They do now. They license trail hunts. We almost managed to do that. We had a big campaign recently <coughs> trying to persuade the AGM of the National Trust to vote against it. There was a member that had the motion. We only lost 160 votes from 30,000 votes. We could have moved, and we might try again in three years. We are very close to get that. And then we want a ban in North Island. There's no ban. There's nothing there that happens as normal. And we also want to ensure that the whole, whatever ban we have and whatever state is properly enforced. And therefore, we want to get prosecutions going, get president in court. And we have done quite a lot. These are some of the achievements we've done on, on all these fronts. We have prosecuted quite a few hunts, some of them basically private prosecutions, some of them the police, with our evidence. Uh, the, the first fox hunting prosecution was ours, well, actually in my case. The first stack hunting prosecution, prosecution also was my case. The first Harris prosecution, almost all the first, the link was behind one way or another. And we managed to get many other things done. But I think I, I'm going to leave it here. Thank you. Thank you.